Penn State football is in off-season mode, but that doesn't mean there isn't information, there isn't things going on, especially in recruiting. It was Junior Day this past weekend. I'm your host, Thomas Frank Carr, here on the BWI Daily Edition to give us a preview of what happened, I guess kind of a, a, a snippet review. Greg Pickle, a reporter for Blue White Illustrated. Greg, how you doing today? Did you get some uh, rest over the weekend? T. Frank, yeah, you know, we had a busy weekend with recruits on campus and, of course, Penn State wrestling in action as well. The basketball team uh, took on Ohio State, too. So, you know, it's funny. As we talked, I think, the last time I was on the BWI Daily Edition, we may be in the off season, but there's not a whole lot of off time for Penn State fans and us for us because there's always something going on. And now we're in the middle of a busy recruiting season and also, obviously, uh, some other sports besides football. Yeah, so the answer is no. Uh, and Greg does a great job, by the way. We'll be getting to wrestling in just a little bit. Uh, if you don't follow him and you want to get some good insight and analysis into wrestling at Greg Pickle, you see it there on the screen. He'll give you uh, what's going on when he's watching the dual meets. And uh, I learned a little bit while just following along with Greg uh, this weekend during Penn State's win over Rutgers. Like I said, we'll get to that in just a little bit. But the main thing we're doing today is we're going to be talking about Junior Day and some of the quotes and information that came out of Penn State's first opportunity to talk to the class of 2023 and beyond in a more formal setting. If you want to hear how uh, Junior Day works specifically, and if you don't know, Friday's edition with Ryan Snyder, we got into the format of what Junior Day is like for those players and what uh, what they go through on campus. So make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel and you check that out. And for the full detailed information, we're just going to be hitting on a couple of things today. BlueWhiteIllustrated.com. Sign up for just one dollar and you can get all the access and information as it's happening over the weekend. They're writing stories. It's all dropping almost in real time. So BlueWhiteIllustrated.com to sign up for that stuff. But what is your first general view of how things went for Penn State over the weekend? Just kind of set the scene. Yeah, so I think the important thing to note is that Penn State, if you checked out uh, over the weekend, BlueWhiteIllustrated.com, I put up a post Saturday morning kind of recapping what Penn State has done historically in January during the James Franklin era. And one thing that you saw in that story was that they don't typically land a lot of commitments in January. So don't be disappointed if Penn State finishes this current contact period out with no new commitments. It won't shock me if maybe one does come up. But right now they're really working on just getting guys to town, letting them see campus, letting them do the photo shoots and meet with academic people and everything else and really kind of set the stage for uh, what lies ahead with official visits in the spring and summer and things like that. So it was a good group of visitors on hand. Penn State got some Florida players in town. A lot of offered guys were here and they have a few more weekends to be or a couple more weekends rather to be able to do that here moving forward T Frank. So from the sounds of it, things went very well for the Lions. Again, just because there was no commitment doesn't mean that it was a bad weekend by any stretch. In fact, it was a very good one, and I think you'll see a commitment or two come out of this group at least uh, that was on campus sometime down the road. Yeah, a couple of guys that we're going to focus on today, Derek LeBlanc and John Walker from Florida, two defensive linemen. Get to that in just a second, but it was probably lucky for Penn State that they, I, I'm assuming they got him out of town before the snowstorm hit that, uh, that hit Sunday afternoon and is going on for a good bit of Monday, so, you know. They, it's cold here no matter what. They're going to have to get used to that, but maybe not seeing the first snowstorm of the year in State College was a good thing. Um, when it comes to uh, the quotes that we're going to get out of Junior Day, they're all going to be positive, right? I noticed that right. a lot of these are all positive. You're not going to say anything negative about a school coming out of this. Have you ever right. seen, like, is that something you ever seen before? And is it's not a surprise, right, that Penn State had a lot of good juju coming out of this? Yeah, you're 100% right, T. Frank. A kid's not going to go on a visit to a school and then say something bad about it shortly afterwards. Now, uh, what you want to watch for in some of these instances, and look, this is not by any means a, a one-size-fits-all approach, but if guys don't do interviews, if they are regular interview guys, like we know that some players, you know, Andre Roy, the former Penn State commit, now Maryland uh, signee is a good example. Some guys just don't do interviews throughout yeah. this process. Uh, Jayshon Barham, his teammate, was the same way. So, you know, if a guy just doesn't talk about anything that's one thing but if a guy who usually does talk maybe isn't interested in having a conversation about his uh trip anymore then that maybe can sometimes signal a red flag that hey uh you know maybe this trip didn't go as planned or maybe this recruitment has changed a bit but yeah, for the most part, when you read these stories, it's always going to be positive. Everyone loves getting the kind of attention kids get on, on unofficial visits. Everything is primed and top-notched and ready to go. So, yeah, you're really, if ever, going to hear anything bad coming out of those. 
Uh, one quote that I do want to pull out of uh, an article over at bluewhiteillustrated.com, and again, to see the full article, and I think it was Chad Simmons that Derek LeBlanc talked to. Is that correct? That's right. Yep. Okay. So one of the quotes, and I'll, I'll throw it up here. First off, you'll get to see Derek LeBlanc. This is his huddle highlight tape. Uh, just to get a sense of what Penn State was aiming for when it comes to this football player. I believe he's 6'5", and you can just see, just look at the size of his helmet compared to his body. This guy is going to keep growing. Derek LeBlanc, he is a top uh, 100 player in the nation, uh, defensive lineman and tackle. This is what he said about James Franklin and his meeting at Penn State. The way I can best describe Coach Franklin is old school. We talked a lot about how he is about hard work and getting the degree. He's not all about NIL, but about working hard, earning the degree, degree, and getting the job done. Now, it's just a couple of words there, but I found some really interesting stuff coming out of that. First off, do you think most people view James Franklin as old school? I don't get the well, sense that Penn State fans see James Franklin as an old school football coach. So, you know, T. Frank, James Franklin has described himself like that before, right? I mean, there's yeah. been numerous press conferences where he has described himself that way. And I think comparatively to some of his peers, he definitely has a more old school vibe, I think anyway, than maybe a lot of the other coaches at top 30, top 40 programs across the country. And I know some will say that's a good thing. Some will say that's a bad thing. And, you know, at the end of the day, I do think that there's a segment of Penn State fans who probably can't envision James Franklin that way. But to me and to a lot of recruits and I think a lot of fans, I certainly think that there's an, uh, a realization that he does have a lot of those old school tendencies to him. You know, they come here and get your degree and don't leave for the NFL early if you're not ready or if you ha haven't you know, finished your degree yet, if you don't have that in hand. So some of those things that we've heard preached for years uh, as college football has evolved, he certainly, I think, more than some of the other coaches across college football, sticks to some of those older values and principles. Yeah, and I, I, I just think it's funny when I uh, hear during the off season, and the reason I wanted to bring that up is I hear a lot of, of Penn State fans, and, and you always hear from the min minority of, of people that are the most vociferously unhappy, but one of the things I hear is that he's not X, Y, or Z, and it's usually he's not like an old school, tough-minded head coach, and I think he's much closer to what Penn State's used to historically than some of the new age stuff that uh, that they're uh, that is going on in college football. The only thing is he doesn't run a fullback. He doesn't run a fullback. Sorry, if you think that's like the key to old being old school as a coach, then that's the one thing. Maybe you got me there. Uh, right. But the other thing that came out of this, uh, and I'll read. The, I want to read this quote again because I think this is also the the most important. Like that's a side mm -hmm. note. The most important is he is not all about nil but about working hard, earning the degree, and getting the job done. Uh, is it a problem that James Franklin isn't selling NIL to recruits? Well, what does he have to sell, right? I mean, right. Penn State doesn't have a big-name player who got a crazy uh, incentivized NIL deal of any kind. I mean, there's been some small ones here or there, but... Unlike other schools, there's no uh, alumni set up or anything like that, at least at this moment, as we talk on January 17, that has anything to do with uh, NIL and supporting players and, and organizing funds and things like that. So, you know, I, was thought, I thought that quote was interesting, and we've heard this before where, well, Penn State's not pushing NIL. Well, guess what? If they could, they would. Uh, I don't think there's right. any doubt about that. And the problem, the bigger problem to me, T. Frank, isn't it, you know, again, I don't, uh, James Franklin and his staff, I don't know what they could push. There's nothing at Penn State to push right now. But the problem is, is that Penn State seems to have no rhyme, reason, otherwise interest in trying to get this thing going. And the longer you wait, the further behind you're going to fall. And I think we're going to hear more and more about how important this is, not just for recruits in the high school ranks, but transfers. I think transfers yep. are going to probably worry about NIL more than high school recruits. Look, if you're a high school recruit, uh, you know, you're going to probably, unless you're a quarterback or a star running back or something like that, probably going to take you a couple years until you have any businesses being interested in giving you any amount of money to do anything. So, you know, I think it's more going to be the transfer guys that say, look, I can be a star at your program, but I want to make some money and put it in my pocket while I transfer to your bigger, big name program. What can you do for me? And so Penn State really needs to get moving on this. I know that, you know, there's been a lot of talk about this and about that and educating people and blah, blah, blah. It's like, well, when do you plan on doing it yeah. exactly? So, yeah. 
you know, to me, yeah, James, you know, it might be nice that Penn State isn't pushing NIL, and maybe some kids will appreciate that. But guess what? At the end of the day, they would push it if they were able to, if they had something to push, and they just don't right now. Yeah, that was going to be the, the next thing is that James Franklin has talked about name, image, and likeness this offseason or th during the season and how it's important and all of those things that you can't lose ground on. And now he has, he's forced to in this situation of, pushing the same thing that he always has. Uh, so that's going to be the next thing is the several hundred thousand dollar question, potentially million dollar question is, is that going to cost you guys? Because if you are a toss up between you and another program and Penn State is not in the NIL game as a university, not just a football program as a university, is that going to cost you the recruits that you're trying to get to that next level with anyway, with facilities and all the other things? Yeah, I don't know if right now, yeah, I don't know if they're going to lose a 2023 kid because of NIL. Maybe one, maybe two. I don't know. I, I would, I'm 50 50 on it, to be completely honest with you. I think it's a possibility. I don't think it's a guarantee. I still think this is a really new space in college athletics and in everyone, for the most part, even the programs that have things kind of lined up and that we hear about. Uh, in the news like Ohio State and Texas and some others, I do think everyone's still feeling their way through this a little bit, T. Yeah. Frank. So I'm not sure it's going to cost Penn State this year or in this cycle. But a year down the road, two years down the road, three years down the road, if these other programs get things together and can really put a strong NIL, NIL pitch together and Penn State's still kind of muddling along and dragging its feet, I think that's when you're going to run into issues. And this kind of becomes a Penn State issue, and it's uh, representative, I think, of some other issues where, you know, they the resistance – I don't want to say it's resistance to change – but there's just not a lot of structure. There's not a lot of organization when it yeah. comes time to really tackle these new things. And keep in mind, you know, Penn State, the program, can't really facilitate any of this stuff. But people connected to it certainly can. And that's where Penn State is falling behind others in being able to, again, get some kind of a fund started or get some kind of thing organized. I know there's some efforts going on, but I feel like I've been hearing about them for over a year now, even though this thing's only been live for, what, six months. Yeah. You know, it was always kind of been discussed in the background that – Maybe something was getting close to coming together or blah, blah, blah. And it just never seems to materialize. So for Penn State fans, that's what you'll want to be keeping an eye on now. And I think, you know, Andy Frank kind of said it. Ryan Snyder wrote this a couple of weeks ago that, you know, Andy Frank basically said, like, you know, fans always ask how we can help. Well, now there's a way you can help. Literally, yeah. a, a legal way you can help. Here's the thing. Uh, I, I get the message better. I used to get calls from the Alumni Association all the time. Like right. there is a structure in place for Penn State uh, to right. to raise funds. Like let's not be let's not joke around about it. like there is actually a vehicle for Penn State the university to raise funds. Uh, you know I don't know I don't know what NIL looks like, and that's I think to your point nobody else does. Right. Uh, but to think creatively and to think about this in in a lot of ways where you can uh, influence this in a positive way for Penn State is the key. Last question on NIL, and this is something I said pre. Previously. And this is just my purely my opinion. I think education should be a huge foundation of NIL. Giving kids a lot of money and not teaching them how to use money properly it doesn't I don't care where we are. Like you should be able that should be a part of any uh, fundamental part of money education for not just football players, everybody. Secondly, um, does winning solve this? So if you are a successful program, I'm not saying college football playoff, but if Penn State were to be in the conversation at the end of the year to be at the Big Ten Championship or the Rose Bowl, does that solve NIL where then companies look at success and they want to be a part of it and Penn yes. State's brand is good enough that uh, you know national, national brands will want to associate with Penn State anyway? I think so. I think that obviously when you're seven and six or six and six or five and seven or whatever, uh, when you play for a team like that, and let's be honest, T. Frank, I mean... Think about Penn State's roster right now. Which one of the guys on the roster is a big enough personality with a big enough voice and then has produced enough uh, to really have kind of a national awareness? I just don't know if anybody has, honestly. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, there are some guys with huge social media followings, but they don't maybe play as much or they don't have the kind of brand recognition that, that brands that want to associate with a, a player might want. Yeah. So, you know, that's the other thing, too. You can say all you want about there not being a structure in place and this and that, and you'd be 100% correct. But the other thing is, is that who, even if there was a structure in place, who are the guys that 
Penn State, uh, you know, that, that Penn State has to promote. And I just don't know. I mean, yeah. obviously you can always promote your quarterback, Sean Clifford, and he's had probably, from what I could tell, the most dealings with any kind of NIL stuff that we've seen so far. But, uh, you know, outside of him, Jahan Dotson was a super player, but he didn't really have kind of the national recognition, fairly or not, yep. that brands want to associate with. So, yeah, you win more, you get your name out there more, and all this stuff kind of ties together nicely, no question. Yeah, uh, just random aside, I was thinking about that as well. Who is marketable on Penn State's roster? And one guy that came to mind just from, you know, watching him be interviewed by our own Ryan Snyder and, and guys like that, if he plays up to that level, would be Caden Saunders. But he's a freshman. Right. Like the guys that you might be looking at, a lot of them are true freshmen this year that just enrolled. Uh, so it's just it's a fascinating conversation in a bunch of different ways for Penn State. Uh, and right now, coming out of just one quote from a guy from Florida, uh, who I think is a pretty outstanding prospect just by looking at him today, I, it, it, they got some work to do. His teammate, though, from a football perspective, I want to switch and just talk about from a football perspective, John Walker, also a top 100 player uh, in uh, the nation. Well, 107, according to the On3 consensus, 15th ranked defensive lineman, and uh, I believe he's like 22nd in the state of Florida, which is always is super deep. Uh, he's a really interesting player from my perspective. As you can see, he is a, a pure defensive tackle here. Penn State has taken a lot of guys like Derek LeBlanc, who are end bodies in high school, and move them to defensive tackle. Because I Izzard is one guy I'm thinking of uh, comes to mind immediately. Uh, with a guy like this, I think you can clearly see already a defensive tackle in his physique. Does Penn State need to get more of these guys? Even if they yes. didn't get the the better ranked player here, a guy that's ready to go, doesn't need to add 20 pounds. He's already yes. that size. You think they yes. need to get more guys like this? T. Frank, I think, and you're more obviously much more of a film and analytics guy than I am, but my thought process just from a purely I follow this, I observe this stuff, blah, blah, blah perspective is Penn State, especially on the uh, interior uh, offensive and defensive lines, but also at tackle as well on offense, has too many players that are projections, basically. They yep. have great frames, but they need to fill out or have – you know, big features and maybe they're an end, maybe they're a defensive tackle, maybe they're a guard, maybe they're a tie. This feels to me like it's too much projection and not enough work in terms of things working out the way Penn State needs them to, right. which has led to some of the depth issues they have. So I do think they need more players like this who are true maulers, who are truly guys that are going to play a position not, well, maybe he'll grow into it, maybe not. We'll see how he does with putting weight on and so on and so forth. So to me, I think that's really – uh, what Penn State should be focusing on here. They're going to continue to try and find guys with big features and long arms and big frames and things like that to build on. You're not going to totally get rid of that. But, you know, I'll be curious to see if you agree. But I think that some of the issues Penn State's run into over the last handful of years at some positions have been pretty much tied to, well, we'll get him here and see how it works out. And, yep. you know, too many of those have been, we got the guy here and, uh, oops, it really hasn't worked out. Yeah, and so I look at three stars – you know, just in a general sense, a three star is uh, two things to me. It's either a guy that that's his ceiling. He's a good football player. You can see how he projects to college, but he is middle of the road. He's not going to be a superstar. And then there are the three stars that they have no game at high school level that you can that you could evaluate on film. But they got big features, long arms that maybe they're super fast, but they are super raw. They are the high upside guys. And Penn State, I think correctly, has tried to take volume over the last couple of years when they couldn't get those four and five star guys that have both. But you right. do have to you do have to buttress that with some guys that you know something about. That, okay, uh, just John Walker, for example. Just on film, my first thing I thought about him is doesn't have the longest arms in the world. That is a that is a thing that may put a ceiling on him at some point in his career. But right. explosiveness, great feet, great motor, everything else, you can see, literally you can see how it translates to the next level. And, and that you cannot undervalue. And right. he's also a top... 107 player in the nation he's top 110 so we're not even in then the, the arm length and all that stuff is splitting hairs and they're right. obviously pursuing him hard but then when you miss on that guy what do you do and I think that's where where Penn State uh, can get in a little bit of a bind where they'll go too hard after guys that are projections as far as their their dimensions like you're talking right. about on the offensive line I'll say though 
they are changing that. They are going much more towards, you can see it on film with some of these guys that they are big, powerful guys, and maybe they are the most elite athletically, but you can yeah. see exactly what they're going to do, and that's one of the changes under Phil Troutwine, I, I think, personally. Uh, last thing I want to get to when it comes to this particular topic of Junior Day. Um, who is the guy that came this weekend that you're most most interested in as far as how he fits at Penn State or whatever? Just who piques your interest the most of guys that visited? Yeah, so, I mean, again, like I said previously, this was a really good weekend, I think, for Penn State. They didn't pick up any commitments, but you're not always going to do that. They had some really talented players on campus, and I think, to me, the one that stands out is Amir Herring, 6'3", 290, on three consensus four-star, the nation's number 13 interior offensive lineman. He's from Michigan, Michigan State, and Michigan kind of are leading the way right now in the on-three recruiting prediction machine. So this visit gives Penn State a chance to get back in front of him. Still going to be an uphill battle, T. Frank, but when we talk about guys who you can see it on film, he's one of them. And he probably needs to add a little bit more weight, of course, to play in the Big Ten. But I think he had a good trip. I think Penn State is going to really push hard for him. We'll see how it plays out. But if they don't land him, they're probably going to face him in the Big Ten for a few years. So I think that that makes him the guy who stands out to me. I wanted to do about 10 minutes on on uh, Junior Day, and we got sidetracked by NIL. That was supposed to be a 10-minute segment. We're on 21 minutes, so th I always appreciate you coming on and talking with us. Quickly, though, I want to get to wrestling. I don't want to miss that because Penn State, we talked about them last week. They come into a, uh, game, a, a duel against Rutgers where they're going to have some lineup changes, and those guys performed well from what I can tell. Brady Berge, Drew Hildebrandt, both making contributions this past weekend. What happened? against Rutgers with those guys specifically. Yeah, so we'll start with Hildebrand. He won by uh, decision 4-2 over Dylan Shaw. Shawver, I believe is how uh, the Rutgers 125-pounder pronounces his name. Good match there. He had to work for it. There was no doubt about it. That was a well-earned, well, -earned, well uh, hard fault, rather, decision for him. And then with Brady Berge, as we've talked about, he's back with the Penn State program, medically retired uh, about 10 months ago. Now is back for one final semester. And they put him in, in the lineup at 165. And he wins his first match back 5-1 over Andrew Clark. That kind of really turned the tide for Penn State. Rutgers had won three bouts in a row, uh, including at 141 and then again at 149 in tiebreakers. So I really thought Bo Barlow was on the wrong end. of. I haven't listened to Jeff Byers' call, but if I was able to go find that audio, I'd be willing to bet he was not thrilled with some of the officiating in that Bo Barlett match. I thought he was on the wrong side of some calls that impacted that but either way you got to wrestle through it he wasn't able to on this particular day but yeah Berge wins uh his first back and we'll see if they keep him at 157 or if they might decide to move him or I'm sorry at 165 or if they might decide to move him down to 157 my gut says at this point they're going to keep him at 65 and I don't know if Creighton Etzel can bump down to 157 and battle Tony Negron for that job but we'll find out over the weeks ahead here but Penn State uh, we do know for sure they will put their best lineup together and they didn't have have it again yesterday. Nick Lee out at 141 yep. because of uh, what we assume was illness or some other injury. So uh, Brandon Meredith, kind of their utility guy, he bumps up and, and fills in all over the place. Uh, he loses at 141 there against Sebastian Rivera, who's really good. He didn't get pinned. He only gave up five and a tech fall. So overall, a lot of positives for Penn State to build on. I know that Kale Sanderson probably would have preferred that things went a little bit better in the middleweights, but uh, they're still working on figuring that out here as they get closer to uh, tournament time. Are you getting a better sense seeing those two wrestlers in the lineup for what Penn State is going to be down the stretch? Yeah, there's no question. I mean, I think when you add it, Hildebrand at 25 and now you bring Berge back, you add not just experience, but NCAA qualifiers. And I'll be honest with you. I mean, right now, with it, let's just say it was, you know, at 25, they really had no answer as far as I was concerned. At 57, Tony Negron seems to be doing a nice job, but they don't really seem to have anywhere else to turn to there. And then, you know, at 65, I thought Creighton Enzo was doing uh, well before Brady Berge uh, took over that job, either via Russell off or whatever happened that ended up with him in the lineup. Or, you know, for all we know, maybe Creighton Enzo was sick and Brady Berge got that uh, opportunity on Sunday by default. But, Regardless, you feel a lot better, I think, about the totality of Penn State's lineup. You knew you had your hammers in the back half of the lineup. You knew you had Nick Lee at 141, uh, RBY, the Roman Robo Young at 133. Uh, and, you know, so you had some holes. Now you have less holes. So I think you're starting to see the best version of this team comes together. And hopefully, uh, before long here, we'll actually get to see the entirety of it on the mat, uh, you know, for all 10 spots without any flu or injuries or illnesses or things like that. I know that it's all it, for casual fans at the very least. 
that Kale Sanderson, Penn State Wrestling, they are uh, just in your mind, they're the odds on favorite to win the national championship, not only individuals, but yep. as a team. Does yes. this group have that potential this year with all the things they're working through? Do you think at the end they could be that sort of team? Yeah, I, I think that now that they've made these two additions, it was probably probably mostly true before that, T. Frank, and now I think it's even more the case. Uh, I really think that they have a lineup that can compete with anyone. Now they are going to, again, probably have issues scoring at some weights. 57, uh, it's not looking like a scoring weight right now. You know, Bo Barlett, I think, can probably, maybe, you know, he's in the All-American conversation perhaps, but he has a work to do too. Uh, he has not scored the way that Penn State fans probably would expect or hoped he would uh, so far this season. So they have some work to do there to score a lot of points at 149. But, yeah, other than that, you know, and then 65, we'll see. Berge certainly has the past history to say that he'll have no problem scoring at Nationals. So, yeah, I do think so. It's not by – it's by no means uh, – you know, peaking too early, that's for sure. I mean, they got some yeah. things to work through here, but with those additions, I think it really made that the case, yes. Uh, Greg Pickle joining us today on the BWI Daily Edition covering all kinds of stuff. Thanks for coming on the show. Appreciate it. All right, thank you. Make sure, once again, if you want more information, you want to get all the stuff, including all the quotes of all the players that came that we have them from, including Evan Link, uh, a critical player from Gonzaga, bluewhiteillustrated.com. He's an offensive lineman. Hear what he said. I believe he was talking to Ryan Snyder, uh, but he, okay, he was. BlueWhiteIllustrated.com, that's where you get that information. Sign up for just $1. If you're listening to the outro music, you enjoyed the show, give it a like, subscribe to Blue White Illustrated, and we'll be back again tomorrow.